daughter is clinging to life. Are you saying this is just a coincidence? This is by far the most shocking case I have ever been a part of. It was unlike anything we had ever seen here. It felt extremely surreal to know that I was, you know, somehow connected to these heinous murders. I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. I went to her house and asked her what happened. And she proceeded to tell me like she was giving me a recipe to a cake. No emotion, no nothing. She must be in great shock. Of course you're in shock. Who thinks of walking in and finding their son dead? How much bad luck can one family have? It's not if Sarah's going to die, but when Sarah was going to die. She was clinging to life. Her brain function is failing. Her liver function is failing. I just felt like I wanted to strangle my mom because of what she did. So are you a killer? this case of Diane Stoudy for about eight years, ever since she confessed to killing members of her own family. She's never talked publicly about how and why until now. We're actually headed to the Chillicothe prison in Missouri, where she's been held for the last six years to hear her story. Hello, Diane, I'm Deborah Roberts. This is a chance for you to speak. <laughs> Which, you know, you haven't done, I guess. No, ever. Do you find yourself wondering how you wound up here? You, a nurse, a mom, a wife, mm -hmm. a, a woman who had a full life? Do you think you deserve to be in prison? Yes and no. Springfield is a charming town. Everyone is really warm and kind-hearted. We have a church and Chinese restaurant on every corner. It's definitely conservative, you know. It, it is definitely in the buckle of the Bible, though. We pray to thee, our God, this day. So whenever things like the Stouty case happens, uh, it really rocks the tight-knit community. Diane and Mark had been married for 26 years and had four children. Sean was 25, the eldest. Then there was Sarah, Rachel, and the youngest, Brianna, who was 10 years old. Mark, her husband, was super active in his band, musically inclined, was fun, lovable. Mark, growing up, developed a very early ear for music, and he wrote very good songs. You're just a female, you come to meet Mark? At the time I was looking for new band members. He was just the perfect guy I would want in my band. And actually we became fast friends. <laughs> Mark was so easy to get along with, our band just jailed immediately. And he was a great front man. He was always a very positive influence in my life. He was always happy with the kids. He was always happy with his wife. He loved them. He loved his family. Diane and Mark Stoudy met in 1984 at a bluegrass music festival. Tell me about Mark and meeting him and what those early days were like. Oh my. He was a different person then. Very outgoing, um, very nice. What attracted you to him? Um, we both liked music. Music was big for both music of us. Music was big for both of us. Did you fall for him? Did he fall for you? Kind of both, I would say. We hit it off. The first time I met Diane, she was pregnant. So maybe the marriage was uh, because of that. But Mark seemed to be excited about them getting married. They seemed to be growing into a relationship. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Stouties were members of the Redeemer Lutheran Church, 
in Springfield. The Lord bless you and the ushers will direct you. I came to know the Stouties right away and then they allowed me to be a part of their family. May you rejoice in this intimacy with your Savior. Music in a church can really be a place where community connects. Diane and her daughter, Rachel, were very involved in our music ministry. Diane was involved with everything when it relates to music and church. I played with Diane and with her daughter, Rachel, and the praise band and for almost two years. Diane played in the church organ on Sundays, and I played a bass guitar. I was excited to, to play up next to Diane Static. I was honored because I knew she was the consummate musician. When did music become a part of your life? I started playing piano when I was three. My mother taught me. It's soothing. How important was your faith to you? Uh, very important. You liked going to church? Oh, yeah. By all accounts, Diane was a busy person. Aside from attending church on Sundays, she was a trained nurse. She worked full-time in the health insurance industry and looked after her four children. Diane is very earnest. Uh, it was very important for her that things were organized well in advance, very, very diligent. And Diane was a devoted, involved mother. Let's talk about the children. How would you describe them? All my kids were a joy. Have you ever heard of little professors syndrome? They all have their little special interests. So in Sean's case? Sean enjoyed reading about Sweden, architecture, mechanics. What about Sarah? She spoke French. Rachel was into Japan. She plays multiple instruments. So she played in the church mm -hmm. band as well, the two of you. Mm -hmm. Was she talented? I think so, yeah. Very talented. And Brianna? Brianna was into dinosaurs and cats. She was gifted with computers. By all appearances, Diane seemed to love her children. And outside looking in, uh, you'd think it was a picture perfect family. I mean, it looks like a very settled, happy family. Mm -hmm. Those are the good old days. You're smiling and the kids look pretty happy. Mm -hmm. Mark looks content. Mm -hmm. When you say the good old days, yeah, how good were they? Really good. Then on Easter Sunday, 2012, tragedy strikes when Diane's husband, Mark, dies. Diane then posts this on her Facebook page. For all my friends on Facebook, this past Sunday evening, Mark, my husband of 27 years, reached his eternal home. I was absolutely shocked. He's older than I was, and this guy was on the front stage performing like he was 21. But is there more to Mark's death than meets the eye? You're a nurse. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you call 911? I was told no hospitals, no doctors, no nothing, or, quote, I will kill you. of Springfield. This is the neighborhood where the Stouties spent most of their marriage. A lot of the homes around here are humble homes. In 1994, 18 years before Mark's death, the Stouty family first moved to the Springfield area. This home here where Mark and Diane lived with their four children, 900 square feet, six people inside. That's a tight fit. And what we came to learn was that Sean was autistic and this family had a lot of issues. So you and Mark are this young couple with mm -hmm. this baby. Was he diagnosed with autism? He wasn't formally diagnosed till he was in fifth grade. My family's impression was that Diane really did not want to admit that he had a problem. Not long after that, Sarah comes mm -hmm. home. What was she like as a baby? Uh, a lot of separation anxiety. She would scream, throw temper tantrums. Are you working at that point? And I'm working full time. I was the breadwinner. I've always been the breadwinner. Mark could never hold a job very long. He would either play music or basically he stayed at home. 
My aunt was bringing in the money for the household, but Mark was not someone who could keep a house. He did not do housework. He was a bit of a slob, unfortunately. So Rachel and Brianna come along. Mm -hmm. Now you have four children. Mm -hmm. What is life like in the household? Too busy, <laughs> very busy. It was a very small home for a big family. Just chaos. I could see that Diane was hurting and lonely. I could see that Mark was a dear soul that was not overly able to provide for his family. Was Mark helpful? For a while. And then he started drinking. I could see that it was a family in stress and a family that was overwhelmed. I never heard Diane say to me, Mark is abusing alcohol. She never said to me, I need help, I need prayer. I'm having troubles. Was he much of a drinker? No, because he blew harmonica and he sung. So drinking wasn't his thing. He made friends in the band. He was close to some of his band members. Did you get to know um, them? Um, I really didn't get to know them. And, you know, by this time he had his other friends that he'd run around with. Other friends? What do you mean? Let's just say they were heavy into drugs. I had coffee with Mark Wednesday of Easter week, 2012. He asked me how I viewed him that I see him as crazy. And I said, no, and I didn't. I didn't see him as crazy. I saw him as a person who struggled in life. Then on Easter week 2012, Mark's bandmates started noticing some unusual changes in his behavior. You saw Mark that Friday before Easter. Right. What was he like? Well, at, we were doing a recording session. We never got the recording done because he was just so out of whack. And I'm like, Mark, come on, we're trying to do a recording here. It didn't even click to him that we were trying to record. One thing struck me so out of place, his skin color. What did it look like? Yellow. His skin was actually a, a yellowish color. So something was wrong. Something was wrong with him. That was the last time I seen him. His children are also becoming concerned about their father. On April the 7th, Sean writes, my father is slowly getting sicker. His voice is slurred. His walking is wobbly. Tell me about that weekend. He had gone to band practice, like usual. He came home, he was stumbling about. I finally got out of bed and he just slept. Were you worried about him when you went to church? Not really because I've seen him do that before. So you come home from church. Mm -hmm. And what do you find? He was still sleeping in the bed. And your husband's And he gone. wasn't breathing. Do you know why he's died? No. What did you think when you heard that your pal had died? Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. It, it took me, it took my breath away. You lost your husband. Mm -hmm. You've got four children. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking? What are you making of this? It hadn't really sunk in. How did the kids handle this? Um, nobody was really surprised. We knew he was getting worse and worse. I talked to Diane. I went to her house and asked her what happened. And she proceeded to tell me like she was giving me a recipe to a cake. No Matter of emotions, fact. no emotions, no nothing. But you thought something was odd. I knew something was odd about the way she's acting. So you try to cope with this and you go to the memorial service. Yes. What was that like? It just felt like I lost my best friend. I was in there in tears. When I looked at her, I kept looking at her and she wouldn't even acknowledge me. And she just kept looking ahead. I thought that was strange. Not long after the memorial service, Diane gets a $20,000 payout from Mark's life insurance policy. So she decides to move the family into a bigger house in a new neighborhood in Springfield. She had moved into a different house by that point, uh, which was good because the house they were living in was 
rather cramped with uh, four children. So we thought, well, good for her and hope that it would help them move forward, so. Incredibly, Diane and the family have only been living in that new home a few months when tragedy strikes the Stouty family again. Yeah, what, what, what is your emergency? It was Sunday, September 2nd, 2012, and there was a couple of police cars out front. We all stood there watching and waiting, and finally a policeman came out, and he said there was a death in the home, but he would never tell us who it was. How much bad luck can one family have? In 2012, Diane has settled into her new home. She's no longer working at a hospital as a nurse. She's got a job where she can work at home as a consultant for an insurance company. It seemed like a new beginning, and though I had conflicts of my own, those are the types of things I typically celebrate for people. This neighborhood has a completely different feel than the first neighborhood that the Stouties lived in. This neighborhood, the homes are a little bit bigger. The neighbors, a lot of them have their homes decorated. It just seems like a perfect neighborhood for the Stouties to move to after such a tragic loss. You've moved to a new home. Mm -hmm. You're in a new place. Are your neighbors aware? Do they know you've lost your husband? No. Why not? Uh, I've never met some of the neighbors. They never seemed like they wanted to have conversation. Every time I saw them drive in, they would start to walk over to say, oh, hello, the garage door would go down. It was just that kind of a feeling of leave us alone. So I didn't try to go to the door anymore. But we did see the boy who we found out later was Sean we saw him mowing the lawn quite often. Every few days he was out there mowing. After Mark died, I called upon Diane and we would have coffee and I would inquire, how are you doing? How is your grief? I would listen, but there was never any statement. I need help, I need prayer, I'm having troubles. So I struggled with knowing why we were meeting. And I don't remember ever talking about matters of life in a significant way. Then a few months later, Sean is very sick. How sick was he? I'm trying to remember. I know he was having some stomach issues. And then there's one weekend mm -hmm. where he's writhing in pain. Mm -hmm. You go up to church and he's really ill. Were you worried? A little bit. A little bit. Mm -hmm. It was Sunday, September 2nd, back in 2012, and our neighbors across the street called us and said, something's going on. There is a coroner's van in the driveway of the new family next door. So I came over to their front door. I said, I'm Rhonda Anderson. I live across the street. We saw there was a coroner's van. And I just want to know what happened, if there's anything we can do. And she said, oh, my son died. Oh, caught me off guard. Your son died. <laughs> OK, was he sick? Was there something wrong? Sean is found dead in his bedroom. And just like his father, he too has an odd blood stain around his mouth. You said that you didn't take Sean to the hospital when you showed up. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you? Because he didn't want to. He didn't want me to. But you're his mom. Mm -hmm. You're a nurse. Mm -hmm. You know when somebody needs medical attention. You could have overruled that. I could have, but I chose not to. What's really heartbreaking about the death of Sean is that the family didn't do much to commemorate his life. There was no obituary, there was no funeral, a little gathering at home, and then he was cremated. There was three of us in the living room. 
and I don't remember the children themselves being there. I remember Diane being there and this director of music ministries and myself. In that moment, I was there to care for a grieving mother in whatever way she presented herself. That's what I was there to do. And was it hard? Yes, it was. We found out that Sean had died from a posting in Facebook from Diane. After an autopsy, the medical examiner determines that Sean apparently died because of prior medical issues related to a history of seizures. With his history of mental and physical issues, it seemed just a spate of bad luck for Diane. So now you've lost your husband and you've lost your son. Then nine months later, Sarah is seriously ill. How do you explain that? By the fall of 2012, Mark's been gone since April. Sean's passed away in early September, and it just leaves Diane with her daughters, Sarah, Rachel, and Brianna. In my 30-some years of ministry, I've never had two family members die in the same type of situations ever. After a tough year, finally a bright spot for the Stoudy family, the eldest daughter, Sarah, is graduating from college, which Diane celebrates on Facebook. Sarah was a hard worker. She went and got a degree. She um, you know, was well-liked, had a lot of friends. But in June 2013, the Stoudy curse strikes again. Sarah is seriously ill, and this time the family is rushing her to the hospital. When Sarah came to the hospital, she was the sickest of the sick. She was in what we call multi-system organ failure, and she needed life support from every organ. The doctors told Diane that Sarah's organs were shutting down, that she was hemorrhaging, her brain was shutting down, and they couldn't figure out why. Sarah being ill and in the hospital was, once again, relayed through Facebook. Again, it was, boy, it's really having bad luck with this family. What's going on? You took Sarah to the hospital. What are you expecting is going to happen? Do you think you're about to lose her? I didn't know. I didn't know how bad it was till they told me her uh, lab results. She's the sickest 24-year-old that we've ever seen. I've never seen a case like that, and I really don't know what's going on. Then the detective came, and I said, thank God. When Sarah went to the hospital with the same kinds of symptoms that had taken both Sean and Mark, warning bells went off. Now I see someone fighting for their life and circumstances and events that are just completely foreign to me. All right, and what is your name? There was an anonymous call made to the Springfield Police Department, alerting them to the suspicious character of both Mark and Sean's death. I shared that I am a pastor and I have a family who's experienced two deaths in a short proximity of time and now has another family member in ICU. I believe that these were circumstances that needed to be investigated. The pastor suspects he's got a dangerous sinner in his own flock, and he can't, in good faith, keep quiet about it. When I first read the tip, it was just kind of like, no way, you know, this, this couldn't be. This isn't something that would, would go on in, in our town or, or our city. So it was kind of shocking that something I, of course, had to look into just to see what, what the tip was about. How are Rachel and Brianna taking this now? They've got their sister who's in the hospital, having lost their father and their brother. Mm -hmm. How are they reacting? They really didn't say much. You know, they, they've always kept to themselves. 
When I read the report about Mark, it appeared that it was natural causes related death, and that's what it was ruled at that point. But when I reached out to the officers that were there on scene, one of the officers had actually witnessed Diane step over the body of Mark while he was on the ground. And he said that they just really stood out. When I read Sean's death report, in both reports, it noted a small amount of blood around their mouth, and so it raised some red flags. You don't typically see that in a natural causes death. When I went in the hospital, the doctor told me that a bunch of tests had been performed, uh, but they weren't able to, to figure out what was going on. Because he's young. We start to suspect drugs. Maybe she took a drug overdose or something, but there was nothing. And we say maybe it's an infection. Came back negative also. We didn't know what's going on. That same day, the detective came and talked to me. My nurse told me the mother was not concerned at all. She wanted to stop the treatment. Nurses told police Diane was too lighthearted. She was joking around with people. She was talking about a vacation and that Sarah's situation, as she called it, was not going to keep her from going on vacation. And she said it just didn't seem, uh, the words that she used was how a mother would act. So the detective goes to the doctor who's taking care of Sarah, and they basically come to the same consensus. He said, OK, I received a tip from somebody that Sarah's father and brother died suddenly. So he said, do you suspect something weird? I said, yes. Are you worried not only about her, but also about how this looks? Were you no. thinking about that at all? Actually, I was worried about why my back was hurting, why my head was hurting, why I couldn't pee. So you were feeling symptoms as well? I was well. feeling symptoms too. The first thing come to my mind was heavy metal poisoning, lithium, uh, and arsenic. But because it's very rare, you have to send it to a special lab. Well, not any lab will have that test. Based upon all the tests that they had run, he believed there was a possibility that it could be a poisoning. I waited for about one week for them to continue with their tests, but everything that they were testing for came back negative. She required life support to support all her organs in order to stay alive. After several days in intensive care, Sarah's condition is beginning to stabilize, but there were still very urgent concerns about the rest of her family. I was definitely in fear for the other members of Diane's family. It was definitely time to talk to Diane to get her side of the story to, to try to figure out what was going on. I'm here to listen. I'm here to... I'm here to... You, you tell me about it, Diane. Tell me everything that was going on. of 14 months, the quiet, God-fearing Stouty family seems to be cursed. Member after member stunningly struck down. Mark Stouty, who fronted a blues band, and 26-year-old son Sean, both suddenly dead. And now 24-year-old Sarah lying in the ICU, her kidneys and brain failing. So you've lost your husband, mm -hmm. you've lost your son, mm -hmm. and now your daughter mm -hmm. is clinging to life. Are you saying this is just a coincidence? I don't know. Now police want to know, is this just a matter of bad luck or bad intentions? Well, again, Miss Dowdy, I, I appreciate you being willing to come down and speak with us. You're very helpful on your part. I'm trying to be. <laughs> it was uh, one of the most stressful interviews I had ever done because going into it there was there was no physical evidence at that point when did all this come about uh she started feeling sick saturday i started asking diane about herself you know how involved in the church that she was so it was just a kind of a general conversation about her family was mark was he active in the church as well or? um not as active but he went 
and in that there was also strategy in, in trying to get her to talk about the, the two previous deaths in her family. Do you have a son as well? No, not anymore. Not he died. He died. He had, he had a seizure disorder. Diane does not seem to be nervous in this police interview. She's quiet. She seems to be answering the questions. The detective is very delicate with her, and he knows he has to be because at any point she could just walk out the door. She was not under arrest. After about 45 minutes, Detective McCamus then reveals that Sean's autopsy is being re-examined. I got a hold of the medical examiner's office, and luckily they still had some tissue that was that was still being held. We've spoken with the medical examiner about that. So they're going to do a bunch of tests on his stuff as well. Okay. So if his stuff were to come back with anything like that, something similar to maybe what Sarah's might come back with, how would you explain that? It's from this point that Diane begins to change her story about how Sean and Mark might have died. I don't know about my kids, but Mark had a lot of weird friends. Well, I don't know if I'd call them friends. Acquaintances. He would, you know, they were into drugs and all that, but that wouldn't surprise me. Throughout the investigation, it, it, it might have come up that Mark would drink on occasion and, and would smoke marijuana. But in terms of, of harder, more illicit drugs, there was absolutely no evidence or any kind of mention whatsoever that, that Mark was involved in anything like that. As far as Sean, Sean had been looking at things on the internet. He'd been threatening to kill himself. And you know whether he's a crying wolf or not. As the interview progressed, there was a point where Diane said something about Sarah also possibly wanting to harm herself and it was during this discussion that Anna Freeze was mentioned so tell me about it there's a lot of arguing suddenly just offers very quietly i knew they were drinking antifreeze it's like what are you talking about nobody just drinks antifreeze okay this could be our poison this could be what we are looking for i just continued to to lean on her about doing the right thing Diane, right now's your chance to to make some of this somewhat right. Because you're gonna want people to see that you're remorseful and that, you know, you're sorry for what you did. He used religion. He's like, look, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, you know, I'm a believer, almost in this sort of priest penitent way. And it worked. Now, yeah, you knew that they were drinking antifreeze. You knew that. They didn't. We both know that. You knew, Diane, that they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. I didn't know what else to do. I really did. He says to her, you knew they were drinking it because you put it in their drinks. And instead of, like, shock, horror, I would never do that, she says yes. What were you putting it in? Coca-Cola. How much would you put in? Just a little bit. From the poisoner perspective, this is a great poison. It doesn't have any real smell. You can't taste it. You can put it in almost anything, and it's acutely poisonous. That's the lethal drink she gave to her son and daughter, Coca-Cola and antifreeze for days and watch them get sick and did nothing. You admit 
that you poisoned your family with antifreeze. Mm -hmm. I said what I was told to say. Who told you to say this? I can't tell you. Okay. So if you can see the force ramp puts some handcuffs on me, I'm going to put them on tight. But I'm saying there's more to that than what people know. Well, tell us because we I can't. really can't go into that for safety reasons. At the time, Springfield police felt pretty confident they had their killer. But they were about to uncover more evidence that would turn this case upside down. The journal was found in the southeast bedroom. And that journal has some sinister secrets. <laughs> this is a story about a wife, a mother of four, who went off the rails. How is it that you could kill your own family, your husband, your son, almost your daughter? Diane was eliminating family members one at a time. And um, basically what has happened is your mom has admitted to killing your dad and your brother and trying to kill your sister. Oh, God. It's just so crazy. You think to yourself, what is going on here? That does not happen here. That doesn't happen anywhere, does it? Diane, they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. What are you talking about? Nobody just drinks antifreeze. You can't make this up. You tell the police that you poisoned your own family. I'm saying there's more to that than what people know. There's more involved. After two hours of questioning, an astounding confession from Diane Stoudy. She admits to poisoning her own husband and children with antifreeze. So at this point, Diane's arrested. Sarah's in the hospital, but Rachel is home with her younger sister, Brianna, and the police need to break the news to Rachel that her mother's under arrest for the murder of her father and brother. And um, basically, what has happened is your mom has admitted to killing your dad and your brother and trying to kill your sister with poison. Just take some time. see the living room of the home it, it wasn't clean and orderly like it is now it was it was a little messy there was couches there were papers just kind of strewn about there's stuff all over the place and on the floor there were a lot of computers everybody had a laptop the search moves to the garage and that's where they hit pay dirt on a counter there's antifreeze and very close to it coca-cola exactly what Diane said she had done to both Sarah and Sean. She fed them antifreeze in their Coke. Mark got it in his Gatorade. This is the bench, obviously. There's uh, different things on here now, but that is that is the bench where where it was located. The positioning of the Coke bottles was, was very odd. A bunch of household cleaners, whatever you can think, and then right in the middle of a six-pack bottle of, of Coke, which was just uh, completely out of place. 
thing that I, I noticed immediately that seemed to be a lot of journals, their writings, notebooks. One journal in particular was discovered. During the search of the house, the police recovered in one of the bedrooms a purple journal on a shelf, just sort of thrown haphazardly on the shelf. The initial impression from the journal is, you know, what in the world is going on here? It's just placed right there, right along with everything else. Nothing to signify its, its importance, just it's right there amongst everything. When Detective Cole got down to uh, the police department, he was flipping through and he came across that and, and realized that it was a, a key piece of evidence. The journal is like a smoking gun, revealing that Diane wasn't the only Stouty involved in the plot to poison the family. There was a journal entry that talked about Rachel's knowledge of the upcoming deaths of Mark and Sean. This entry showed evidence of premeditated murder and that Rachel knew about it. It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months. Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. Who would think that a daughter would be assisting her mother in the killing of the rest of their family? Get some water, you okay? Now, with this new discovery, Officer McCamus brings Rachel back in for questioning with a new agenda. He wants to confront her about that journal. Were you ever suspicious of your mom? No. It sounds like you and her, from talking to her, that you and her were pretty good buddies. Is that right? You guys were real close. Mama's best friend, kind of. Mm -hmm. Did she ever mention anything at all? No. So she never told you specifically that she wanted to hurt your dad, your brother, or your sister? No. Mm -hmm. During the interview, I just slid the journal entry over to her. I wanted to see her reaction uh, upon looking at that. There was an immediate sense from Rachel. You could just see the look on her face of, it was, uh-oh. Do you recognize this? You could see the wheels turning, literally. You could just see her processing of how am I going to explain myself out of this. Yeah, I remember this. Okay. What is that? A little journal thing. A journal thing? Whose journal? Mine. Your journal? So you wrote this then? You're telling me. Okay. Rachel, at that point, I think she realized uh, I, I, I'm caught. And she began to tell her story. No more lies or untruths. We need to be honest about everything. You understand? What is this? I've had a lot of really bad dreams about them dying. I talked to mom about it. And she mentioned she was thinking of hurting them. I pressed Rachel in terms of, hey, this isn't a dream. This is something much worse, worse than that. And you were involved. So you said you'd been having some dreams about them dying. And you told your mother about this. What did you tell your mother? That it would be quick. That... involvement in the crimes with Diane. It told me that, that Rachel was was just as involved as, as Diane. They were a killing team. A mother-daughter. I mean, this is unheard of. Who does that? It still is just beyond comprehension to think that a mother and daughter, you know, systematically poisoning off each one of their fa other family members. Rachel is just as evil as her mom. You're saying Mark is the first one. There's nobody before Mark. Not in your past life or not in okay. Mark's the first one. And it just got started. You said you hated his guts and I just he couldn't take it. Couldn't anymore. take it anymore. Once the confessions began, it was just one shocking revelation after another. But the strangest one was yet to come.
My name is Mark Saverick. I am retired FBI criminal profiler. I was in the FBI's behavioral analysis unit for almost 13 years of a 23 year FBI career. When you look at Diane, you see an individual who has no remorse for the actions that she's engaged in. She's very upfront with what she did and why she did it. Sean would be interfering with whatever I would do to the point where he was getting into my work. And I would have to tell him, you need to leave, you know, go to your room, go do something. You get to the point where you just pull out your hair. That interview is all happening before she's had a chance to talk to anybody else. So that's really your best information. I couldn't figure out a way to change. You know, I couldn't get them out of the house. I couldn't leave the house. I think I snapped. You said, I couldn't figure out a way to change. I couldn't get them out of the house. I couldn't leave the house. I think I snapped. I really do. I just lost it. I don't remember that. Is that what happened? I don't know. I don't remember that. You don't remember saying that? Mm -hmm. um, you said you hated your life. Mm -hmm. So have you just decided not to remember? No, I don't remember. started with mom because she just wanted to find some way to make it simpler and the reasoning to get rid of your dad tell me why for him and then tell me why for sean why did you guys want to get rid of those two dad was basically a drain on her on us money he had no concept of money <laughs> You'd always be out partying, always be out. Sean and me argued on a lot, because I still think we could have put him in a, like, in like a assisted living, but she wanted him out. So clearly Diane is, is the ringleader here. But I think it's extraordinary that she draws her daughter in to this plot and that Rachel goes along with it. So when did the plan to kill Sarah come about? May, June. May or June? And so why did, was it decided to kill Sarah? Other than the fact that she basically lived in the back bedroom and didn't, like, have any gumption to get a job, I'm not certain. Mom probably has her own issues with her. What about you? He's annoying, yes, but... I don't know. Unbelievable motives. And she vocalized them. She said these things. And what did you guys finally decide upon on how you were going to kill them? You poisoning, I know you said that, but what? how, how were you guys going to poison them to kill them? Mom decided on antifreeze. Antifreeze. And why was antifreeze decided? Because in general, you could put it in something and you couldn't taste it. The chemical that we're talking about is ethylene glycol, which is the alcohol component in antifreeze. And when we metabolize ethylene glycol, our body will eventually turn that into a couple of very dangerous elements that attack organs of the body. They slice and dice where they land. They're really bad for you. You do not want to drink antifreeze. Would you put the antifreeze in the drinks whenever you gave them to your dad, or, would you, or how would that go? She would mix them and then just pass them out. So if the tops were already unscrewed, that's how you knew not to drink them? Mm -hmm. Women are far more likely than men to use poison. Women tend not to use overtly violent guns, knives, bludgeoning to kill. How much, though, 
how long did it did it take to uh, when you were you put it in coax for him also, or what did you put it in for him? Gatorade. Okay, so you put it in Mark's Gatorade, and was it coax for both Sean and Sarah? Okay. And when did Mark start to get sick? He got sick on Friday. Okay. And when when did he die? Sunday. I think they knew what kind of poison they wanted. They knew what they wanted the poison to do. And they knew that they didn't want the poison detected. And you say you expected the antifreeze to, after they drank it, that it would, it would be quick and it would kill them right away. Were you surprised when it took a while? Is that why you continued to give them more? Yeah, because I didn't know what else to do. Sometimes we say it's easy to take candy from a baby but it's actually easier to give candy to a baby and in this case it's easy for diane because her husband her son and her daughter trusted her implicitly for them to witness the demise of three family members who they were poisoning slowly over time it's not just that they're cold and calculating but they have become completely immune to the suffering of others when a poisoner has to be called to the bone because every step of this process, they're planning to kill someone, that's okay with them because the focus is how do I get away with it? What Rachel tells police next may be the most heinous of all. There was a plan that Brianna was going to be killed as well. They were going to kill the little girl as well? What's wrong with these people? Stouty case in my career is by far the most shocking case I have ever been a part of. Have you ever woken up and your life is so bad that you can't stand to be in it? Are you, are you asking me? Yeah, because that's what I felt like. Okay. When you hear about a case as diabolical as the Stouties, you have to ask yourself, how does it all start? Music was their outlet. Rachel was a great musician, a very talented singer. Rachel played in the church for almost two years. They were two peas in a pot. They were mother and daughter team out of all the kids. You know, Rachel was the closest to her, and they definitely had a, a you know, um, a, a relationship that was tighter than any other person in that family. They were very close, mother and daughter. And I think that they became alliances to each other. During my interview with Diane, especially when we were talking about Rachel, I just got this really odd sense because of the way you know, she would talk about Rachel. She would light up. It was obvious that Rachel was the pet. Did you have a favorite? Not really. A lot of people think I did, but not really. Who was more like you? Uh, Rachel. How about Rachel as a child? Mm-hmm. How was she? She's my first one that actually talked. <laughs> I really didn't have much problems with her. Rachel had discussed with me that they were just kind of like a matched pair. They understood each other. They got each other. And Rachel said that that's why she just wanted it to be her and her mother. There is some kind of psychological chemistry between the two of them that could explain the folie I do or how the two of them fed each other psychologically into committing this crime together. Rachel always looked up to her mother and her, her mother groomed her for this in terms of how she saw her father, in terms of how Diane saw Mark. And so when Diane thinks Rachel is ready to be brought into this to help her out, um, she does and Rachel acquiesces. But once that, was set in motion. Clearly it was a path that that they could not veer from, that they did not veer from. When, when, when were you guys gonna kill Brianna? Sometime after Sarah. And how are you gonna do that? Well, she liked root beer. Could easily have gone the same way that we did with the others. 
Oops. We didn't really go into any new ways. She had described uh, Brianna as a burden they didn't want around the house. That was her explanation. Four people? They would have killed four people in this house if they could have? Correct. Rachel said that her mother was the only one that understood her. They could relate to each other, and it was just going to be those two. I guess the ultimate goal was that it was just going to, you know, she, Rachel was the golden child. I'd like to know why you guys eventually took, you know, when Sarah got so bad, you, know, you guys said you thought that she was pretty much dead, but why did you take her to the hospital? I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. This is really just a different way of saying that guilt is knocking on the back of her brain. Her own culpability, her own responsibility, her own role for their deaths is making it impossible for her to feel comfortable in the house where her crimes occurred. Fortunately for Sarah, she got to the hospital and got treatment just in time to save her life. We thought initially she's not going to make it, but then after 24 hours, thankfully, she started to get better. Sarah makes a pretty miraculous recovery and a shocking revelation. So you read in her journal? Yes. That Sean had died and that your name was listed too? numerous charges of first-degree murder and assault on Sarah, now in the hospital, seriously ill. As for the youngest daughter of the Stoudy family, who is about to enter the sixth grade, church officials inform me she's currently in foster care. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. When Diane was charged with murder, it was tough for me to wrap my head around that. It was surreal. We were just totally shocked about that. That does not happen here. That doesn't happen anywhere, does it? This don't make no sense at all. Why she would even go that far? If you don't love your husband, divorce him. But to sit there and literally think about how you're gonna get rid of your family? I was like in shock. How could she do that? What was the reason? Why would you kill your own husband, your own son, and attempt to kill your own daughter with the help of your other daughter? That's incredible. I was sitting in the audience. Rachel and Diane were brought in. She never looked at me, either one, Diane or Rachel. Diane and Rachel plead not guilty for first degree murder. Sarah was in really bad shape doctors and everybody else they, they thought that, that Sarah was gonna die and it was a it was miraculous that she survived Sarah fortunately survived but she will never be the same she suffered a lot of brain damage because of the antifreeze and, and organ damage she had to start from scratch learning how to do the most basic things it is a miracle that Sarah survived but how will the poisoning impact her in the long term I met Sarah in 2016 while she was still recovering, living in an assisted living facility. It was the first time she had ever spoken publicly about how she survived a vicious poisoning at the hands of her mom. What were you feeling in that hospital bed when you woke up? I just couldn't move. I was bedridden. Clearly, the ethylene glycol and the antifreeze, when it's metabolized, it creates an acid that has fairly significant effects, obviously, on the kidneys, on the, on the brain. In fact, Sarah had a, a brain bleed. Sarah had to relearn to walk. Now she's reliant on full-time, round-the-clock care. It's just heartbreaking. Did you think you would live? No, but I had this will to live. I did not want to die at a young age, and I thought that my mom is going to kill me after my dad and brother died. 
You thought your mom was going to kill you? Because she had this journal that she wrote. She wrote, like, deaths of Sean, my brother, and me. So you read in her journal? Yes. That Sean had died and that your name was listed too? Yes. And what did you think when you read that? I was worried because I don't want to die. Did you say anything to her? She told me you're not going to die. Did she explain what this was all about in the journal? No. She just told me, don't read it. Throughout the investigation, there was talk that Sarah had uh, knowledge of the events that were taking place. And um, it's hard to say exactly how much that Sarah did know. How about your mom and your sister, Rachel? Do you still consider them family? Not anymore. I just don't consider them people. I consider them as killers who hate me. And what would you have somebody say to Rachel and to your mom? I just felt like I want to slap both of them and calling them B-words. Sarah said after learning what had happened that she wanted to slap you, she wanted to call you a certain word, that she was very, very hurt and angry. What do you say to your daughter who is damaged because of this poison? I'm sorry for what she went through, but I'm sorry for what everybody goes through. I'm sorry for what I had to go through. Are you saying that you were poisoned as well? I can't rule it out. Diana's turning it into all about her. It's me, me, me. Sarah wasn't just sick, I was sick too. I mean, this isn't just deflection. This is really squarely returning to the thing of I'm the victim. Diane did not have any appearance whatsoever of being ill during during our interviews. Sean, you say he wasn't too much into church, and no. neither was Sarah. Not really. And she seemed totally cognitive throughout. There, there was there was nothing at all to indicate that she was anything other than than fine. Were they sinners or? I hate to use that term. <laughs> you know. Diane, you understand that this sounds like a woman who doesn't want to take responsibility for what she confessed to doing, which is killing her family. That's not what happened. Does your family believe that you're innocent? I don't know about innocent, but I don't think they are, they think that I'm totally guilty. So are you partly guilty? I can't tell you. Her inability to actually answer a question, her inability to show any emotion, it could be a ploy to explain away a psychopathy, an antisocial personality disorder at the very, very basic level, a level of narcissism, which is very consistent with her. So what do you say to Rachel then? I think Rachel doesn't know the whole story. But as the trial draws even closer, it isn't long before one defendant turns on the other. When you have Two people, she said, she said. Usually someone takes a deal, and it's the first person that takes a deal that gets the lesser sentence. Prosecutors say Rachel and her mother Diane used antifreeze to poison her father Mark and to poison her brother Sean. Virtually undetectable in taste, making them sick until their organs failed. The state wanted the death penalty for Diane. Diane's case was death penalty eligible just because of the extensive research that she had done in, in planning it out, the torture that she put them through. And what were you putting it in? I felt it was important that she be held responsible for what she had done. How much would you put in? Just a little. The state wants the death penalty for Diane, but for Rachel, life imprisonment this was diane's idea diane was is the one that you know has the motivation for doing it clearly in this case rachel's the follower we get word of another hearing both for rachel and diane and the big announcement is made is that rachel has not only pleaded guilty she pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against her own mother that was a bombshell it was always something that you know 
us in the newsroom, we tossed around the idea of what if Rachel testified against her mom? We always assumed one was gonna go against the other. When you have two people, she said, she said, usually someone takes a deal and it's the first person that takes a deal that gets the lesser sentence. Now that Rachel has pleaded guilty to her role in the crime, she's looking at two life sentences plus 20 years, avoiding the death penalty. There's so much evidence against Diane, it doesn't look good for her. She could face the death penalty. She knows her daughter is going to testify against her, so she finally agrees to plead guilty. Based upon her plea of guilty uh, to the class A felony for murder in the first degree, she is uh, sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole in the Missouri Department of Corrections. You pleaded guilty to murder. Are you a murderer? No. No. And I didn't plead guilty. I took an offered plea. You that's took what I That's what I was told to do. I was told that it was not considered a guilty plea. So you took a plea. Mm -hmm. You acknowledged that you killed your family members. I said what I was told to say. An Alfred plea, which means she is not technically saying, I did this, I am guilty, but she is saying, the evidence you have is enough to convict me of this charge, and I agree that that is the truth. So we looked across and we weighed all the costs and benefits of whether to continue to seek the death penalty or to accept that plea. It simply made more sense to take the plea. I did not like the Alford plea. I, I personally thought that Diane should have faced the death penalty in this case. Life in prison, no possibility of parole for Diane. She's going to die in prison. sentencing, unlike her mother, she apologizes to her older sister, Sarah. I'm sorry that I couldn't find the courage to stand up for what was right, to go for help, to protect you, our siblings. I was scared that being scared is no excuse. I sensed a little more remorse, maybe, with Rachel than with Diane, but I also noticed a lot of uh, attempted remorse, I guess maybe you could say, with Rachel. There was um, crying at times, but no tears. She won't be eligible for parole for 42 and a half years, around age 65. And I just want to be clear on this. You confessed to killing your own family. Yep, to save my family. They were being threatened. Threatened by whom? Somebody. But Diane, many people would say this makes no sense. Lots of things don't make sense. She has zero remorse, zero empathy. She doesn't take any responsibility for her actions. She wants to control things, but she doesn't seem capable or willing to actually put the story out there herself. It's like pulling teeth to get any kind of answer from her. You've essentially taken responsibility mm -hmm. for killing your family and right. people would ask you how is it that you could kill your own family your husband your son almost your daughter how does a mother kill her own children that i can't tell you we pushed for more than an hour thinking diane might finally own up to her crimes but you did it no then she blew us away spinning one bizarre alternate theory after another what is the truth, Diane? Many times throughout our conversation, Diane pointed the finger at some mystery person, saying he or she forced her to falsely confess. I said what I was told to say. But our investigation found no basis for this. Diane never once claimed this in court or reported it to police or anyone else. She also touched on Mark's alleged drug habit. But now she's beginning to suggest that he was more involved in the drug trade than anticipated. Mark was with some people that are very dangerous. People have disappeared. You're saying that someone in Mark's world tried to poison him? I was told in jail that Mark had been green-lighted. Green-lighted? Green-lighted. Green-lighting means that somebody's been authorized to be killed. It means to take the shot. 
take the person out. They're green lighted. There is nothing whatsoever to show that anybody was involved in this case other than those mentioned already, Diane and Rachel, the ones that, that killed their family. Who poisoned Sean and who poisoned Sarah? Sean left a note. So you say that Sean took his own life? Yeah. Sean did not commit suicide. He was murdered. Quite the fairy tale, I would say, that she has concocted. It really is astonishing. Diane agreed to talk with us to give her side of the story, but her version of events seemed less and less credible. I find everything that she says in this interview to be incredibly contrived, very carefully controlled, very well scripted, and not forthcoming. Rachel says that you were poisoning and killing your own family, that you might have even poisoned Brianna before it was all over. No. Were you going to? No. How are we supposed to believe that? I don't know. What is the truth, Diane? The truth is out there. Because this person has recreated their truth in a way that is necessary for self-preservation in prison. She may not even be clear in her own mind what the truth is any longer. What about Sarah? Sarah is now living in a group home. She's been permanently injured. This is a fairly recent picture of Sarah. Oh, wow. She's gained weight. What do you want to say to her? That I hope she's happy. I'm sorry for what all she's gone through. But I hope she's happy and content. How hard is it to think back on what has happened to you and to think about Rachel and your mom at this point? It's very hard. At the same time, I love them, and at the same time, I hate them. Conflicting emotions? Yes. Do you see yourself at any point forgiving? Yes. I had forgave them for what they did. Because forgiveness is the right thing to do. story. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a family broken because of why? Hate? Sarah fortunately survived, but everything that that interface did to her, that's lifelong changes. That is a life-altering event. She will never be the same. Look at this one you pointed out. Who is who here? That little boy here is my brother, Sean. That's me. You're such a cute little girl. What do you find as memories hanging out with your dad? Oh, I love going to concerts with him. Mark Stoudy's music may have been more prophetic than poetic. Just listen to the lyrics of his final song, Female Judas. <laughs> to this day, bandmate Charles Alexander still hearing those haunting lyrics in his head. I just wish that I could have helped him. I wish I could have saved him. Who would do that to their family? Why? There's bad relationships everywhere, but you don't destroy your own family. <laughs> 